So hello, uh, my name is Garth Boffman. I'm an economist at the Federal Reserve Board. And today I'm gonna to be presenting a paper called Global Demand for Basket-Backed Stablecoins that I've written with a colleague of mine named Gene Fleming. I just wanna take a moment to thank the organizers. It's a really great uh, program that you guys have put together and I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. I should also say that uh, you can find the full paper on my website, which is uh, www.garthboffman.com. And I also welcome any comments or questions at my email, which is garth.a.boffman at frb.gov. So one more housekeeping thing, I have to make a disclaimer, which is that the analysis and conclusions set forth are gonna be mine. Uh, they do not indicate concurrence by the other members of the research staff, the Board of Governors or the Federal Reserve System. So there's this big new thing in payments, which is uh, stable coins as a new payments uh, means of payment. So what are stable coins? Well, they're gonna be crypto assets whose value is tied to one or more other assets. So this could be gold or diamonds, but the ones that we're gonna be interested in are gonna be tied to some currency. So most are tied to a single currency. For example, Tether is tied to the US dollar. At the end of 2019, it had a market cap in excess of 4 billion. But there's many others. So make or die tries to keep its value stable by following an algorithm of, of a certain kind. Uh, there's true USD, which is a competitor to Tether, Paxos, Gemini Dollar. The list continues to grow. There's many, many of them out there these days. We're going to think about a particular class of stable coins that have been proposed, which instead of tracking one single currency, are going to try and follow a basket of, of several currencies. So the most prominent example of this is gonna be Facebook's Libra, which was, when it was proposed last summer, uh, was going to follow a basket of, of different currencies and had a mission to enable a simple global currency and financial, financial infrastructure that would empower billions of people. So subsequently, Libra 2.0 has added uh, single currency coins alongside the basket, but they, so far as I understand, are still uh, talking about the basket. Another prominent proposal came from a governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, uh, and his proposals for the uh, artfully named synthetic hegemonic currency. So uh, he suggested that such a, a global basket coin could dampen the domineering influence of the US dollar on global trade. More recently, uh, just like a month or so ago, there was a proposal for an Asian digital currency backed by a basket comprising the yen, yuan, yuan, and Hong Kong dollar. And this was proposed at the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference just a month ago. So when you're thinking about stable coins, there are lots and lots of questions that can come up. And I imagine a good portion of this whole week is, is, gonna, is uh, dedicated to these various questions. So for founders of a, of a coin, there are questions about technical design and implementation. Once you start thinking about uh, coins that you're trying to keep at a stable value, you need to worry about liquidity management and transaction pricing, how you're gonna custody the reserve fund if you keep one, and many other questions. From regulators, you tend to get a different set of questions. So they're worried about various risks. So risks if the stable coin were to scale widely, they're worried about risks to the payment system, to transmission of monetary policy. Regulators are often concerned about consumer protection, anti-money laundering, and counter-terrorist financing, um, among others. So I'm not gonna talk about any of that today. Uh, instead, I'm gonna focus on a much more basic kind of uh, question, which is just what are the fundamental economics of a basket currency? I'm gonna break this into a few different parts. I'm gonna ask, how does basket backing affect demand for a currency from the public? How would a basket currency affect welfare? So does it make people better off if they use it? And what is the effect on both of these demand and welfare of the basket's composition, the weights of uh, how you design the basket currency? So just to step back for a second, what are some of the intuitive reasons that people have proposed? as to why a basket-backed stable coin would be beneficial. Well, looking at Mark Carney, uh, the question seems to be about political economy concerns. So he thinks that 
having a basket-backed currency would reduce dependence on any single country, specifically the United States, economic policy, so monetary policy and trade policies. There's also a question of having broad attractiveness. So if people have a behavioral preference for a currency that's close to their domestic one in some sense, then a basket currency might have a broader appeal across the globe. There's an important knock-on effect in payments economics when one thinks about adoption, which is network effects. So if one has a global audience, the more people that use a currency, the more people are going to accept it, and so the more useful it becomes. There's a whole separate consideration of portfolio theory concerns as to why you might want a basket currency. And that's going to be uh, that the basket currency might have less volatility than its components through something like a law of averages. In this paper, we're not really going to think about political economy or behavioral reasons. We're really going to focus on this last one, which is the portfolio theory explanation for why a basket currency might be desirable. But we're also going to think a little bit about the network economics. And we'll leave the other uh, uh, questions for future research. So I've given you a little bit of an introduction. Let me just summarize the big takeaways of what we're going to do and what we get out of it. So what we're going to do is build a micro founded model of money and trade and currency choice. In this model, we're going to have trade shocks that are going to drive demand for a basket backed currency. We're going to calibrate up the parameters of that model and numerically solve it. When we do this, we get four basic findings. So our first headline finding is that holdings of the basket currency in our preferred calibration are going to be relatively low, comprising less than three and a half percent of world currency holdings. Our second major finding is that despite these low holdings, the welfare benefits are not insignificant, and they're going to be on the order of about 2% of GDP. So how can those two things jive? How can it be that people don't use a currency much, but is substantially beneficial to a world welfare? Well, it's going to be that people hold this currency and spend it in cases where marginal utility is really high, in cases where they really wished that they had that little bit of extra value to buy. After we think about those two first order concerns, we're going to consider the composition of the basket. And we're going to find that the composition of the basket is not terribly important for welfare. It doesn't have big effects on welfare. I'm not going to actually show you this exercise today. I don't really have time, but all the details are in the paper and you can look at exactly why that happens. But briefly, there's a disagreement. Um, among different parties for the, the consumers from different countries as to which way they want the basket to go, whether they want it to be like their currency or a different one. And this disagreement leads the overall welfare effect to be relatively small of changing the basket composition. Finally, we're going to do an exercise where we think about these network effects. And specifically, we're going to think about whether low demand for the basket would incentivize, is sufficient to incentivize sellers to actually invest in the technology to accept a currency. And we're going to find that it may not. It's kind of a suggestive calculation, and I'll walk you through it at the end. If I was to summarize in a phrase what we find in this paper, it's that various fears of basket-backed currencies may be overstated for these reasons that I'm highlighting, that their holdings would be relatively low, and that they may be beneficial. So let me talk to you about this model that we've built. I'm not going to show you any math today. If you go look at the paper, you can see all the gory details and all of the equations. I'm just going to give you the building blocks that go into the model. So the academic predecessors uh, are going to be uh, these two papers, one by Lagos and Wright and one by Shang. Lagos and Wright is a workhorse monetary model. And the model from Kathy Zhang is going to be a model of uh, international currency competition. 
So this is, this is where we're getting our inspiration for the competition between the various currencies. So in the model, I'm gonna have two countries. I'm gonna call these home and foreign. And I'm gonna suppose that home is a larger country. So we're thinking of the United States in our calibration. Within each country, I'm gonna have two kinds of agents. I'm gonna have buyers and sellers. The model is gonna have a timeline. It's gonna be discrete time. I'm gonna have discrete periods. And it's gonna go on forever. People have long horizons that they're planning for. And each period is gonna be broken into two subperiods. First is gonna be a decentralized market, that's the first subperiod, and then a centralized market, that's the second subperiod. In the decentralized market, there are one-to-one -one random meetings between buyers and sellers. This is gonna be the retail exchange part of the economy where people are gonna need money. The second subperiod, the centralized market, is the international market with general consumption goods where people can trade currencies on a foreign exchange market. And that's where they're gonna do their portfolio balancing. And all agents are gonna discount the future at a standard rate. So drilling down into this decentralized market, I have buyers and sellers. They're only gonna differ in this decentralized market. In this decentralized market, buyers are gonna receive utility from consuming, but they can't produce. Sellers are gonna produce at some cost they don't want to consume. And I'm thinking of the good that's traded in this market as being a retail good, something that you go out and, and physically search for, and such that it's going to be specialized. You couldn't, uh, it's not always the case that any two buyers and sellers could trade. It is going to be the case that the good is divisible. So it's not a lumpy thing. You can, you can divide it up. That's going to have people uh, buying different quantities based upon their currency holding. And then finally, I'm assuming that the good is non-storable. So you can't use this good as an asset to finance purchases. Trade is gonna be subject to certain frictions. Buyers may travel from their home country to uh, the opposite country. I'm gonna suppose for simplicity that sellers don't, that they're gonna stay put. Meetings in the decentralized market are gonna be anonymous and temporary. There's not gonna be this ability to commit that would allow me to give you goods on a promise that you pay me back later. So I'm ruling out credit in this economy. This is all to motivate the need for a medium of exchange, which is gonna be money. It's gonna be our three currencies. But then within a meeting, we're gonna have buyers and sellers bargaining over price and quantity, subject to the limitation that a buyer can only transfer the money that they already hold. So trade in the centralized market is gonna be in a general good and then money. People are gonna rebalance their money holdings. And this is gonna be a competitive Walrasian market. So prices are set according to normal supply and demand. Buyers are gonna to work to produce this general good. And they're gonna use that good that they produce to get money that they're gonna carry into the next decentralized market. Sellers are gonna take the money that they had from the previous central, uh, de decentralized market and sell it in the centralized market to consume this general good. There's an important technical assumption that comes from this Lagos Wright paper that agents in the centralized market have quasi-linear preferences for this uh, 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 general good. The importance of this is going to, it's going to remove the history dependence and therefore wealth and, and wealth effects. So I'm not going to have to carry around histories of individual agents. That's all going to get wiped out each period. So in the decentralized market, trade is anonymous and there's no commitment, so I need some medium of exchange. That medium of exchange is gonna be currency issued by governments. So I have a fiat currency issued at home, a fiat currency issued uh, in the foreign country, and I'm gonna have both, country, both currencies growing at some constant equal rate, funded by lump sum taxation. Importantly, I'm gonna have kind of dumb central banks here that don't respond to anything. They just keep the currency growing at a constant rate. So this is a purely monetarist uh, central bank. Then the third currency, the innovative part of this model is the basket currency. So what is the basket currency once you drill down into the details of the model? So it's gonna be a technology that in the centralized market 
combines some kappa units, nominal units, of the home currency with one minus kappa units of the foreign currency into one unit of the basket. Once that unit is assembled, it can't be broken apart until the next centralized market. So this currency really is a separate currency. It's not the same as carrying around a Forex portfolio. So I have this further assumption that in each centralized market, all previous issuance of the basket currency is redeemed, meaning they trade it back to people, trade back the underlying currencies to people. This is gonna have an important implication in terms of pricing of the currencies. It's gonna force an arbitrage condition such that every period in the centralized market, the value of the basket is just gonna be a straight uh, weighted average of the two underlying sovereign currencies. So this assumption rules out bubble equilibria and speculation and anything else. So this really is gonna be a stable coin. It's important to remark at this moment that besides uh, the composition of the currency, there is no fundamental difference in between the fiat currencies and the basket currencies. It's not the case that the basket currency is cheaper to use or uh, uh, can be used electronically, whereas the sovereign currencies can't. I don't have any of that in the model. This is really just about the portfolio value of having a basket it first exchange rather than individual sovereign currencies. So I'm gonna have trade shocks that are gonna create demand for this basket. Specifically, I'm gonna have these per persistent trade shocks that affect the frequency of inter international meetings, the probability that you travel from home to foreign and vice versa. For simplicity, I'm just gonna have two states I'm gonna have a trade state where there's a positive probability of travel and a no trade state where there's no probability of travel. But because of these different possibilities, portfolios of individual buyer, of, of buyers in each country are gonna adjust depending upon the state. So if you think there's a high probability that you're gonna travel, you might want to hold some of the other country's currency. This fluctuation in demand is gonna create fluctuations in the value of currencies affecting those countries, those currencies purchasing power. Because currencies purchasing power fluctuates, there's demand for a more stable unit of, of value, uh, medium and medium of exchange. And that's what's gonna be served by the basket. I'm gonna to refer to this value of the basket as the insurance motive for holding the basket. If a currency is expected to depreciate upon the arrival of a trade shock, you would rather hold the basket because that currency would depreciate less. There's another, another motive for holding a currency, which is gonna be spendability. So for, for me in this model, spendability is gonna be how many sellers accept a given currency. And let me turn to that now. So sellers are gonna differ in each country based on their type. And what, is, what do I mean by type? Type is gonna dictate which currencies you're set up to accept. So in, for now, I'm gonna assume that this is exogenous, but I'm gonna consider several different cases for the composition of the population of sellers. For timing, just to reiterate, at the beginning of a period, nature is gonna draw the trade shock. So whether you move to the trade or the no trade state, then the decentralized market is gonna open. This is my retail market. Buyers may travel and agent, then agents trade bilaterally. And the amount that they can trade is gonna depend upon the buyer's money holding and the seller's type. After the retail market, this decentralized market, then I have a centralized market which opens. An outstanding basket currency gets redeemed, agents produce, they rebalance their portfolio with sovereign currency they may buy new basket currency and they consume that general good and move on to the next period. So I get some theoretical results out of uh, this, this model that I wanna talk about before I turn to the numerical simulations. So the first point that I wanna make is about the composition of, not of the basket and its relation to sovereign monetary policies. 
So the result that we get in the paper is that if you have a nominal, nominally fixed basket, so if the basket is 50 euro cents and $50 cents, then existence of a stationary Markov equilibrium is going to require that both of those currencies grow at an equal rate. That is, both countries have to have the same monetary policy. They have to have the same long run inflation target in order for me to construct an equilibrium. So what's the intuition for this? Well, suppose that one currency had higher inflation. If each period that currency depreciates relatively, then that currency comprises less real value of the basket. Well, then eventually the basket currency is not gonna have any value coming from the high inflation currency. All of the value of the basket is going to come from the lower inflation currency, which rules out the existence of a stationary equilibrium. So this crucially is a result of these constant nominal shares. And it raises questions as to how basket weights should really be determined and indicates that fixed nominal shares are probably not a good idea. I have a conjecture that instead uh, fixed real weights would provide a, 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 um, a better system, but we're gonna leave that for, for future work. Most of the proposals that we've seen for, for these currencies either haven't explained how they're gonna fix the basket, or they, they explicitly say that they're gonna rely on these fixed nominal shares. And, and so that's what we're gonna to model today. The second theoretical result that I wanna talk about is the feedback effects of the basket currency on the value of sovereign currencies. So to reiterate, trade shocks are going to affect the demand for currency and therefore its value. In a high tra trade state, demand for the other country's currency, local demand for the other country's currency, goes up uh, because the probability that I'll need it to trade is increased. When countries are of different sizes, like we're going to assume here, there are differential effects of this state transition. So importantly, the small country's currency is gonna be more volatile in response to these uh, trade shocks. In this environment with volatile currencies, the basket is gonna have two, two kinds of effects. There's gonna be direct effects of the basket, uh, kind of partial equilibrium effects, and there's gonna be some indirect effects, uh, feedback effects, general equilibrium effects. So the partial equilibrium effect is that the basket's movement is always going to be between uh, the movements of the two sovereign currencies. And this provides insurance. That has a direct effect on portfolios through a substitution effect. I like the insurance value of the basket, so I'm going to uh, decrease my demand for other currencies. There's also a general equilibrium effect that's going to go in the other direction. So when demand for a basket varies across states, the value of the component currencies is going to be more volatile. This is going to reduce the insurance value of the basket. And the indirect effect of, uh, is going to have, this is an indirect effect on portfolios through prices. Okay, so now let me turn quickly to these numerical exercises that we've done. So the different exercises are going to depend upon different assumptions about seller's acceptance probability. All of the other parameters of the model, we calibrate to match the United States and Mexico. And you can go see the paper to, to see the details of how we calibrate the model. The five scenarios that I'm going to uh, uh, think about differ in the, the, which sellers accept which currencies. The first scenario is going to be a national currency scenario. So sellers in each country are going to only accept their local currency. In the international currency scenario, this is going to be a dollar dominant scenario. H sellers, the sellers in the home current country, are only going to accept their own currency. But two thirds of the sellers in the foreign country are going to accept uh, the home currency, while only one third only accepts F. Then we have three cases uh, with the basket. First, I'm going to have a foreign adopts scenario. So no H sellers are going to accept the basket, but a large share of F sellers are going to take it. The home adopts scenario is the reverse. And then in a both, I'm going to have a both accept scenario where about two thirds of both H and F sellers accept the basket alongside their domestic currencies, with the remaining third of each sellers only accepting their domestic currency, 
and I'm going to think of these as the government. Uh, the government's never going to take uh, uh, some exotic stable coin to be used uh, to pay taxes. So there's always going to be some uh, agents that hold out. I talked about how trade shocks affect uh, um, currency demand. This shows up in the relative values of the currencies across states. So this zeta is going to be the value of, the, of a given currency in the trade state divided by its value in the no trade state. And you can see that these values differ significantly between the, across the five scenarios. But importantly, the basket is always in between the two. All right, let's, think, let's look at currency demand in each uh, of these scenarios. So first in the national currencies example, if you travel, your only option is to use the local currency. Nobody accepts uh, other people's currencies. The key thing to take away from this picture is just that buyers are gonna hold some of each currency in both states. Why do they hold it in the no trade state? Because there's some chance that they'll transition to the trade state and need to use this currency. Of course, demand for, uh, foreign, for the opposite currency is gonna be higher in the trade state than it is in the no trade state. In the international currencies case, so this is the dollar dominance case, home buyers only demand their own currency, while foreign buyers demand a little bit of, of, of both. Uh, so I should say demand for both currencies is somewhat lower in this economy. Why? Well, because dollars are substituting for foreign. In the national currencies case, we always both needed both. Now home only needs home and foreign can also use home for lots of its transactions. So when I compare things to the basket cases, I need to think about these partial versus general equilibrium effects. So the hot colors here are going to be partial equilibrium. The cool colors are going to be uh, uh, general equilibrium. And the thing that I really want to point out is that in partial equilibrium, the insurance value of the basket currency is much higher. So this is the foreign accepts basket uh, equilibrium. I should also point out that in this case where only one kind of buyer accepts the currency, you only demand the currency in one kind of state, one state, and that's to ensure against the state where a given currency would depreciate. So in the both accepts, all that I want to point out here is that the difference between partial and general equilibrium kind of washes out, and that's because both buyers are moving in and out of the currency. So just to get a takeaway, in both of my one country accepts scenarios, you uh, have much higher uh, demand, whereas in the both accepts, it's about the same. That said, there really is significantly higher welfare under the both accepts relative to the uh, international currency case because money demand is much higher because the basket currency is serving a stabilizing role. If you think about basket composition, people are gonna end up disagreeing and the result is that welfare is not that important. I'm running out of time, so I'll just say, if you calculate seller's willingness to pay to, pay, to accept the currency, you get relatively low numbers. So in everything that I've showed you, I fixed seller's uh, acceptance profile, but given that fixed behavior, I could calculate their willingness to pay. And it's not as much, it, it's really not, that high. And so there might be some concern about getting sellers to actually accept these currencies. So in conclusion, uh, what did we do today? I built a model of decentralized exchange with trade shocks to study demand for basket backed money. Abstracting from many risks and costs of such an asset, we find that general equilibrium effects on component currencies volatility limits the basket's value. The presence of the basket, if, both, if sellers in both countries accept, can greatly improve welfare. Optimal basket weights are going to depend upon where the, country is, the currency is accepted, but they don't matter that much for welfare. And low demand on the part of buyers for the basket currency is going to limit sellers' willingness to pay to accept the basket.
So thank you guys very much. I uh, hope you have a good day. And I uh, welcome your questions.